Don't you just love your pastor? Amen. Let's give our honor to God. Lord, we worship you. We bless you. We thank you that your spirit is here. And God, we thank you that this is a day. This is a time that your spirit shall come upon this nation and the nations of the earth for the greatest outpouring that this earth has seen. And we stand in a moment with you the living God and I pray that you would pour out your spirit in this place in an amazing way not of my might not of my power but God by your spirit and I pray that the people their eyes would be open to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit that will speak to them and give them insight perspective that does not come from this earth but comes from the throne Lord, I pray that by the time today is done, that they will hear your heart and they'll know that the mouth of you, the Almighty God, has spoken. We worship you, we bless you, and we thank you that all powers of darkness are rendered powerless. Witchcraft and divination is absolutely the fire of God has rendered it useless in the name of Yeshua. And everyone said, amen. Well, why don't you smile real big at somebody around you, and you can go ahead and be seated. It's great to be here in Louisville. You know, I, I have such an honor for Kentucky, and um, I grew up watching. I used to be a, I want to say used to be a Kentucky Wildcat fan back in the days. I don't know, you guys are probably, <laughs> you're probably too young to remember, because I'm probably older than a lot of you, but there was a, a player, Kyle Macy, that used to play back. Y'all remember that? And they won the national championship. How many remember that? Do you, so I guess maybe we're about the same age, or you just know good history. But uh, you know, on the way in, we were flying, and there was uh, we got to see the Kentucky Derby, and I thought that was pretty cool too. So, how many of you ever been to Kentucky Derby? I didn't ask if you had bet on the horses. I said, how many have been there? <laughs> okay. Well, anyway, I send my love for my wife. She's actually holding our two services down. Uh, at Lord of Hosts Church, and I thank God for many of you that support the ministry. We're very, very grateful, and uh, I thank God for all that he's doing. By the way, Pastor Bob, you got a great lineup. Kent Christmas is a very good friend of mine, as well as Robin Bullock. They're the real deal. You're definitely going to hear from God uh, over the next few days, and um, you know you might as well turn off the news anyway, but uh, there's no greater perspective than heavens, and that's what you're going to hear. So, uh, we're on. yeah, you can give a hand clap. And uh, what you hear them preach, uh, just know that I sent my notes ahead of time. So hopefully, that was a joke. Y'all, y'all, y'all laugh here. Okay, but uh, tonight I'm very excited. You know, obviously uh, I'll preach the next service, but tonight I really feel is going to be a real strong prophetic flow. And I'll say this: uh, How many of you have watched Flashpoint uh, with Brother Copeland's ministry? Uh, thank you, and I'll let Pastor G know. But we started Flashpoint back in August. And uh, we were talking to the back room. I'll never forget it, where I was meeting with uh, Brother Kenneth Copeland for two days. He wanted to pray. He said, you ready to pray eight to 12 hours with me? I said, sure, I'll pray with you, Brother Copeland. Not many people get to do that. And so uh, Matthew, my son, wave your hand. He went with me, and Brother Copeland said, bring the word of the Lord. And so uh, I said, okay. And I didn't have a word, and on the airplane, the Lord spoke to me, and he said, tell the people that uh, and Brother Copeland, that the decade is going to start off harsh, and then it's going to come into a place of rest, and it will be a celebration like this uh, country and decade has has not experienced. Well, how many know it started off harsh? And uh, I had been prophesying that back in 2018 and 2019 that this decade would start off harsh, and God told me back in 2018 that there would be a plague, and He. He called it a scam, and uh, of course, we, we watched the scamdemic play out, uh, and it's still trying to play out, but I say that because it was in August of uh, 2020, and I was meeting with Brother Copeland, and I told him, I said, the Lord said to me, August 16th, it's a public prophecy, you can see it out on our website at Hank and Brenda, August 16th, the Lord said that they would steal the election, and that they would do it on purpose through a chaotic plan, and how many of you know 
Uh, that's what we've been watching. Now you say, well, I don't believe that. I will believe the word of the Lord before all of the nonsense of anybody else. You know, God already told him. And so I told Brother Copeland, he said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, Brother Copeland, I just keep feeling something in my spirit that uh, we have to respond ahead of time. And so he uh, got with Pastor Gene and uh, they started Flashpoint. And we've been doing that uh, almost three years now. So I thank God for many of you uh, that are watching. And those of you, I don't know, there's a camera somewhere. Where's the camera? Thank you so much, those of you that are also supporting. All right, well, here's the deal. I want to preach to you. And what we're going to do tonight is very important because uh, God told me something a long time ago. He said, Hank, wherever I send you, uh, it's very important where your feet land. And so I don't just take invitations to take invitations. I really don't because, and I'm not trying to sound over spiritual. I'm just saying, how many of you, you have a relationship with God and you're accountable to him? And uh, I'm doing the best I can to honor him. And he said, where I send you, there's a prophetic purpose and destiny. And so when I was talking to Pastor Bob several months ago and he said, would you come April 16th? And I knew that was the timing that God said, put your feet here. Well, little did we know that your, your city would be wounded. And uh, Pastor Gene had asked me, he said, would you be willing to come to Nashville in May? Well, how many of you know they had a wounding in their city as well? And the reason that I say this is tonight we're going to do a prophetic act. And uh, I'd ask Pastor Bob to bring a couple things that we're going to do. Because there's, there's something that we have to understand. It may not look like it. And I tell you this because it was in August when God gave me that word about the election. I'm a big HO train guy. How many, anybody a uh, HO train guy? So I was a uh, model train guy. And I was working on my trains. And all of a sudden the whole atmosphere began to change. And I smelt this beautiful aroma, and I know that when God walks in, I've had visitations from the Lord. There's something so beautiful. It's why he's called the Rose of Sharon. He carries a fragrance that I have never experienced before except when he comes. And I knew he was walking in. I didn't see him, but I was shaking on the inside because of the magnitude of glory. He is the glory. And uh, I was facing my layout, and I knew that he was walking behind me, and I smelled his presence, and I... I heard his voice, and man, it, it breaks my heart every time in a good way. He said to me, and it still bothers my theological mind, he said, may I talk to you? And I dropped to my knees, and I buried my face as low as I could go to the carpet, and I said, God, you are the almighty God, and you are asking me for permission to talk? And he said, I speak to you. And he said, I want you to understand. This is when he revealed to me what they would do to our election. And he said to me, he said, I am dedicating the election of 2020 to the honor of my son and to the honor of the children of this generation. And he said, do you think that they will be able to steal my nation from me? And he said, I have released an anointing of preservation. And he said, many times they tried to kill me. But they couldn't because when I walked into the temple and I declared in Luke chapter 4, he said, look at me, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he has anointed me. And from that moment when he closed the book, all eyes were fashioned upon the living Christ. And yet they tried to take him out to the brow of the hill and kill him. And the Bible says Jesus passed through them. And the Bible records in the book of John over eight times they tried to kill our Messiah. But they couldn't because he announced something that was upon his life. It was the anointing of preservation. And, and at one point in the garden, Peter thought he could help Jesus. He took out his sword and cut the ear off of the young man Elkis. And Jesus said, put it away. Put it away. Now is the time. And at that moment, they said, are you the Christ? And he said, I am he. And they fell backwards. That anointing was still on him until he said, now is the time. And that anointing of preservation lifted off of his life. And he laid it down so that he could be crucified. Why am I saying this to you? Because that day that Jesus walked in and he said, do you think that they're going to be able to take my nation from me? He said, I have released an anointing of preservation. This country has been preserved by my spirit. And do you know that same anointing is on your life? Whenever you declare Psalm 91, you are declaring an, uh, a psalm of preservation. 
that's connected. You know, when you also connect to Psalm 23, it's not a funeral scripture. The fact that your head, your cup overflows with the anointing oil, and you may walk through the shadow of death, but it ain't going to touch you. No evil can come near your dwelling because there's an anointing of preservation and God has anointed our country. So tonight we are going to release that anointing of preservation not only over your life, but we are going to release it over this city. And we are going to pray and prophesy and let God speak. He's already been speaking to me about this church and I can't wait to release the Lord. So I'll see you at five. How's that sound? All right, let's open our Bible. Uh, there's a great anointing in here. You guys are a praying people. This is beautiful. I go into some churches and it's like, okay, you got to be everything. You got to be your own band and I don't sing. You got to be your own prayer. Uh, but you guys have it here. So let's give honor to God and to, to your pastor. All right. I'm going to go very quickly because he told me I had three minutes. I'm teasing. I want to talk to you about one of the greatest signs in the Bible that is of our day to day, that people are ignoring. They're not even paying attention to it. And yet they quote a lot of the previous verses of one of the greatest signs I'm going to tell you, but they don't preach the sign I'm going to talk to you about. So can I take you on a quick journey? If I don't get to everything, uh, you can watch the next service, or perhaps maybe you can come to the next service if you'd like. But Jesus said something in the book of Luke, chapter 12. And I want you to see this, and we can follow. I don't know if they put the scriptures up or not here. But in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 54, Jesus said these words. When you see a cloud in the west sky, you say, hey, there's going to be a shower. When you see the south wind and it begins to blow, you say, hey, there's heat coming. But then Jesus says in verse 56, he says, but yet how is it that you can discern the face of the sky? But you cannot discern the times. There are people today that are pontificating. They're looking at things that are happening. And I watch it. Whenever there looks like there is bad and doom and gloom that is happening, people automatically get out their Bibles. Nothing wrong with it. And, and here's the thing. I'm all for teaching prophecy. But what we have to be careful of is just because someone can pontificate and teach prophecy doesn't mean that they stand in the sacred office that Jesus himself chose and called them to be a prophet. Here's my point. Sometimes people will talk magog, gog, and then they put time frame on it at the time of eggnog. And so what happens is people begin to put their interpretation upon things. I was meeting with Oral Roberts when he was 88 years of age. And he wanted to pray over me. And uh, he, he regarded our ministry very highly prophetically. And he said, you're carrying a word for me. I want you to come. And as I was meeting with him, I'll never forget it. He said to me, he said, you carry a word for me. What is God saying to you? And I said, first of all, your son will be with you when the Lord's chariot shall come and that mantle shall fall upon Richard. And many will get an impartation, but he'll get the mantle. But I said, Dr. Roberts, what are you going to do when you're 91 years of age and the sound of Christmas bells are in the land and God will come himself with his chariot and take you. And when you go, it will be then that the greatest healing revival will begin to take place in years to follow. Do you know he died December 15th, right before Christmas bells? I'll never forget. He looked at me and his eyes were big. His wife had just gone to be with the Lord. And he said, you mean to tell me I have to live another, I think it was four years or three years? I said, that's what God's saying. He died at 91. Why am I saying this to you? Sometimes we put our interpretation on things rather than letting God speak it to us. Because we're living in a time right now where the news is telling us a lot of things. And we have to understand that when God sent prophets into kingdoms and, and, and in certain times to speak into the culture, do you know that 90 plus percent of the time, whatever the prophets announced, it was always opposite of what happened and what was going on in the culture. So you're hearing a narrative that is being spoken right now by the media. 
You're hearing it by a few evangelicals and a few people that are pontificating prophetically. And if you listen to them, you have this idea that everything is just falling apart and nothing is going to ever get better. And yet the prophets are coming saying, hold it. Even though there is darkness, God has declared that we are in a revolution. And it's not a revolution of blood. It's a revolution of light. Do you know what a revolution is? It's a purposeful overthrow. And God is purposely overthrowing the powers of darkness so that his kingdom can shine and his glory can come. And God will give Jesus his harvest that he deserves. So Jesus is saying you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the times. Let me give you an example. November 27th of this uh, last year, 2022, the Spirit of the Lord began to prophesy, and he said there's going to be three strategic signs they are going to show this country and the nations of the earth that I am moving and I have a plan to move. You see, in Mark chapter 6, many Christians have the same spirit that was on the disciples in Mark 6. The Bible says in Mark 6 that the hour had come, it was late, and, they, and Jesus had been feeding the multitudes for three days. And so now it's dark, and the Bible uses the word, it, it, the day had been far spent. And some Christians are like the disciples, where they look at the darkness, they look at the day, and they think, well, can anything good happen? They look at gas prices, inflation. They look at what we went through with having to have a mask on our face and the COVID thing and mandates. And they think, can anything good come out of this? And they're like the disciples where they are looking at things in the natural and not understanding that Jesus is injecting himself right now into what is going on in our country and in the nations of the earth. And I'm going to tell you that tonight. And so here's what they said. Here's their answer. Jesus, send the people away. In other words, God, just take us out of the earth. Rapture us. Now, how many believe he's coming again? But that cannot be, yes, we're to say perhaps today, but we cannot have a mindset that we are so looking at all the bad that the media is portraying and things that are happening that we just want to get out of here and not give God what he deserves. You know what that is? A glorified church. And a harvest that he deserves. So there's things that are happening. Now, let me read you a scripture out of the book of, of Habakkuk. Now, November 27th. God said there would be three signs. Number one, he said he spoke to California. He spoke to the drought-filled areas. And he said, when it rains and rains and rains in abundance over California in the drought-filled areas, November 27th, 2022, he said, then you will understand that I am the one that is bringing the rain of my presence and I am dealing with the darkness. Now, how many have been following the news? What's happened in California, what's happened in the drought-filled areas, they've had rain nonstop. Then he said there would be a second sign, and it would be that we would measure snow. This was November 27, 2022. You would measure snow in feet. And how many of you know that they recorded, said this year in America, they've had more measuring of feet of snow than any other time in their history. But then he gave a third sign. He said, look up and look to the sky. And when you see the sky, there will be a disruption with the communications. But know that I am the God that has this country in my hands. Do you know what happened? Two to three weeks after that prophecy, November 27th. Yeah, we were looking through the skies because all of the air uh, uh, travel shut down. Do you all remember that? And there was this big shutdown. But God had said it ahead of time. Because sometimes we're so looking at what the news says, we're not hearing God's perspective. So I want to talk to you about that. Habakkuk chapter 1, I like this in verse 1 of the NIV. Here's what it says. It says, how long, Lord, must I call for help and you don't even answer me? Then he begins to describe what I believe is a lot of what's happening today. He said, there's violence, but you're not saving us. Why do you make it look, make us look at injustice? How many of you feel like that? Where's the victory in our courts? And why do you tolerate wrongdoing? You know what I'm talking about? Listen, when I grew up, we used to, if you're a guy, you played, you know, G.I. Joe. If you're a girl, you had a G.I. Jane. Now they're selling at the stores G.I. Don't Know dolls. You know what I'm saying? 
that there's a lot of wrongdoing going on. Destruction, strife, conflict. And he says this, laws are being paralyzed and justice never seems to prevail. And yet, if you would just stop at verse 4, you would think, okay, this is our culture. This is what's happening right now. God, there's no answer. And then all of a sudden, God answers the prophet in verse 5. And he says, listen to me, prophet. And I speak this to those of you that are watching. Listen to God. He says, I will work a work in your day. Though it be told you, you won't even believe it. Now, we know that's also talking about Jesus. But how many of you believe there are prophetic narratives? that apply to a particular culture or generation. Let me give you an example. A guy pulled me aside and he said, yeah, yeah, I track your prophecies. But he said, here's the deal. He says, I don't care about your prophecies. I said, okay, that's fine. I don't care about you. I, don't, I didn't care about him. Thought he was prideful. I hate arrogance. Arrogance is a stench to God's uh, spirit. He said, I don't, I, he goes, I don't, I, don't, I don't care. I said, well, listen, what, what's your beef? He said, we're in the days of Noah. And I said, I don't disagree with that. He says, yeah, we're in the days of Noah. And don't you know that this country's being judged and we're getting out of here? I said, hold it. First of all, how good is your theology? Noah stayed in the midst of judgment. He didn't go anywhere. I said, also, do you understand? Yes, there is judgment that is happening in these days of Noah. And it is against something that happened in Genesis 7 when the fountains of the deep state or the deep state of things was broken open. And I said, what you have to understand is God is judging, just like he did in Genesis 7, the deep state of things. He's dealing with corruption and evil, just like in the days of Noah. But what did he do with Noah, which represents the church? The Bible says he lifted that ark above every high place, every high mountain, every high hill. God is exalting his church, and he's going to raise us up as a glorious church before he comes. And I said, those are the days of Noah, but I said, watch this. God, also in the days of Noah, reset the earth and brought a divine reversal. And this, my friend, according to the mouth of the Lord God himself, is happening right now in our country and in the earth. Divine resets and reversals. You know, the Lord prophesied that. March 15th, March 15th of 2020, I was, I was caught up over the earth in a vision. And the most powerful voice that I heard, I don't know if it was the Lord himself or one of his angels, spoke to me and revealed to me to get President Trump off of the campaign uh, field at that time. Showed me some things I won't go into detail. Delivered the word of the Lord. Two weeks later, he's off the campaign trail. Just like what the voice said, where they would be at, described the scene. But here's the thing. God said, then he said to me, when this happens, the president will get COVID. I said, well, I'm not going to tell him that. But I wrote it down and delivered the word of the Lord. And God said, many accuse him of being prideful. Yet when this happens, he will pray more prayers than he's ever prayed before. And I said, well, why, God? He said, because I need something from him as I did Hezekiah. I need the president to turn his face to the wall so that God could give grace to the king or the president and give grace to the country. That's why God's not done with them. You say, well, how do you know? You got to go back to a prophecy 2018, 2019, 2020. God said, there are two in the earth that I have put my anointing upon. One I speak of, Netanyahu. He shall rise up again, and he shall be prime minister. But you know what? You're quick to clap, but the hate mail was pouring in. False this, false that. Listen, I would not touch a friend of God. When people start getting keyboard warring and they touch the friends of God, especially if they're a prophet, prophets are the friend of God, and there happens to be prophets that are the friends of God that are very close to the Lord. And when people start keyboard warring, calling this one false, calling that one false, 
And, and I tell you, what they do is they do the very thing that Nathan the prophet did to David the king. The prophet went, friend of God, confronted David, and guess what? David said, get that guy. And Nathan said, I just brought the court of heaven to you. Be careful. What you point, Jesus said, what you judge, remember there's three pointing back at you. Don't call out somebody else lest you will get called out. And so I want to say this because there are things that are happening right now in this country that people don't understand the right perspective of what the word of the Lord is and what heaven is saying. And God is trying to let us know that we are in a time of a great reset and great reversal. On that March 15th, the Lord said to me, there will be a great reset and a great reversal. Do you know after that prophecy was given, something literally happened in the earth? And I didn't know it. I'm just releasing the word of the Lord, saying about this COVID, saying about the campaign trail, then all of a sudden releasing a divine reset, a divine reversal. And I had no clue that, did you hear what happened literally to the core of the earth? It literally, you can Google it, it literally reversed. And scientists said the earth literally stopped and reversed itself and reset. Now, if God revealed that ahead of time prophetically, shows it in the natural, what are we getting so scared about? Well, I have a business, so does God. Make it his business and your business will be blessed. That's why when Pastor Bob gets up and talks about a $30 million building, don't let it bother you because true people of the kingdom realize that your seed is the greatest when you invest it in hard times. It's when you get the greatest return. All right, let's talk about this. So there's signs that are happening. We're not here to just look for the rapture bus. There's going to be signs in nature. I'm going to make it very quick. Jesus said that there would be earthquakes. Luke uh, chapter uh, 21 says that there will be oceans that will roar. How many of you have seen signs in, in uh, the, uh, the, uh, the nature? I remember one time being on Sid Roth, and uh, he was interviewing me, and he said, Hank, you know how Sid talks, Hank. And he puts me on the spot, and you know you've been interviewed before. There's nothing worse than being put on the spot. They do that to me every week on Flashpoint because I don't, I don't typically look at news headlines. Sometimes I do, but I don't watch the news. So the first time I hear things is when I'm looking at it and they're asking me the question. But Sid goes, Hank, tell me something totally supernatural <laughs> that only you and God knows that you have never said before. And I was young on TV, you know, so I'm like being a dummy. I said, oh, okay, because I thought I had to answer Good friend of mine, Bishop Harry Jackson, he's in heaven. He's the guy, the black gentleman that prayed uh, in the Oval Office with President Trump. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, he said to me, he used to do all the Fox News, CNN, all that stuff. And he said, you never have to answer the question. So if you ever do TV, just realize you don't always have to answer the question. Right? I mean, okay. And so I answered, though. I said, the Lord says, watch this coming winter. There will be snow that will hit in all 50 states. He goes, you're saying this winter, all 50 states. I said, and I paused. I thought, oh, no. Because you ever just spoke and then put your foot in your mouth? And so I went back to the hotel room, and I don't know what your relationship is with God, but I laid on the bed, and I said, um, Father, come here. <laughs> um, that just came out of me, Lord, and I really need a favor right now. So if I've ever done anything nice, would you make it snow in all 50 states? <laughs> no, I literally did because I was scared, man. And, and so I said, Lord, I, I, I need a favor here. Do you know that year uh, was the year that it snowed in all 50 states? Well, why? Okay, it's one thing to make a prediction. And I teach this when I teach on the prophetic. It's one thing to have a predictive way. Prophets have a predictive nature, but that's, you know, psychics do that. So it's, so it's not that. It's what does it point to? What's the redemptive plan? And God gave the scripture in Psalm 68 that snow, it was snowing in Zalman when God dealt with wicked kings. How many of you know that? And so he was saying that he was going to deal with the wickedness that's over our country and cleanse it. 
David said, wash me whiter than snow. So there's signs in nature. There's signs in society. How many understand that we're having to deal with a woke culture today? And thank God that you have a pastor that is awakened. He's not woke. You know what the woke culture is today? It's Matthew chapter 11. Jesus said, comparing to John the Baptist, he said, would you come out to see a reed shaking in the wind? You know, a lot of churches are just bending with trends, bending with whatever. And then he said this, he said, what'd you come out to see? A king clothed in soft linen? In other words, you want your messages nice, you want it soft, but there's no power. So there's signs in nature, signs in the culture. And then he also talked about signs and technology. Daniel talks about how there will be knowledge that will increase. He talked about signs in politics, right? Uh, there's a Herod spirit. How many know what the Herod spirit is? Matthew chapter 2, Herod killed the children that were two years and younger. How many know Herod spirit is spirits that work through government? That's why for the Christians to put their head in the sand and ignore politics, don't understand. The whole reason that we had a successful revolution in 1776 by less than 5% of the population of America at that time was because the first concealed carriers, y'all are concealed carriers, you know it, women, so this is Kentucky, y'all have, you know. But, but here's the point. The first concealed carriers in America were the Black Robe Regiment, and they were preachers that had guns underneath their robes, and they would literally empower their congregations to go out and begin to beat their shovels, whatever they had, don't fight the conventional way of the British Army and take our country. And it was motivated by the preachers behind the pulpits. So there would be signs. Herod that goes after the children. That's abortion. How about Herod's son who killed John the Baptist? Well, we saw that, the attack against the prophets. Then there's Herod, uh, the grandson, who went after and began to, remember, cut off the head of James, the apostle, so it attacks the church. And here's what people don't realize. Thank God for your pastor and other pastors that are uh, uh, not afraid to talk politically and, and engage uh, the congregation with what's going on. Because here's the problem. We have spirits that are beheading the voice and the expression of the church as we saw it with the COVID mandates. You know what I told my governor? I wrote a letter to my governor, wrote a letter to my mayor, and I said, we're not doing this. I shut down for, you know, a little bit, uh, not very long, and I said, whoa, I'm getting plagued. Because nothing around me was being shut down but the churches. And I said, listen, I'm not doing this. And they just said, okay. Because we never push back. So there's going to be signs in Pollock. How about this? Signs in the cosmos. He said, look up. There's going to be wonders in heaven and signs in the earth below. Blood, fire, and vapor of smoke. And the doom and gloom people, you know, oh, there's blood. See, bloodshed, fire, vapor of smoke. Well, what about the, the blood of Jesus being shed for a billion souls? What about the fire of Acts chapter 2 with another outpouring like in the day of Pentecost? What about the vapor of smoke, which is the glory that showed up as, as it did on Mount Sinai? What about that sign? And then there's going to be signs that are spiritual, a great falling away. There's going to be spiritual signs that the Holy Spirit is moving. But I want to show you in closing, Matthew 24. Jesus in Matthew 24, how many are familiar with Matthew 24? Raise your hand. And the disciples, very quickly, in the closing moments of this time, they said to, to Jesus, give us an indication when the end of all things will be. And Jesus said, the number one thing, and I, and I look at Christians today, and they are absolutely doing what Jesus warned. He said, let no man deceive you. Three times, it was one of the greatest signs that it repeated was deception. But then he goes on and he says, listen, there's going to be wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in various places. Nations are going to rise against nation. But he said, the end isn't yet. Then he says, Lawless, lawlessness will increase. Many will be offended. But it's just the beginning of sorrows. But it's still not the end. And look at this closing verse, Matthew 24, verse 14. Jesus said something that I think is the greatest sign. And I don't hear a lot of the prophecy teachers ever preach it this way. And I'm not saying I'm better. I'm just challenging because we cannot ignore this scripture. It says the gospel. What's the gospel? Very quickly. I've got just a couple minutes. What's the gospel? The good news. 
The good news. The good news. Isn't that what it is? You could say, the good news shall be preached. Or, the good news shall be promoted. Or, you could say, promote the good news. Or, you could say, promote the goodness of God. Then it goes on, the good news shall be promoted, preach, as a witness. And it's not just, oh, we're going to preach the gospel and witness. Do you know that that word witness is also to imply demonstration? You're going to promote God's good, and something is going to show up that's going to prove that you are promoting his goodness. You know what it's called? The glory of God. It comes as a witness. How do you know? Exodus 33, verse 18, very quickly. Moses said, God, I want to see your glory. And the first thing God said is, I'll pass my what? Goodness before you. Goodness and glory go together. Last scripture on that, 2 Chronicles 5, verse 13. It says that when they were one, they began to say something out of their mouth. And they said these words, and I challenge you that are watching today, and I challenge you in this room. This needs to be what comes out of your mouth. The Lord is good over America. The Lord is good over my marriage. The Lord is good over my family. The Lord is good over my life. And his mercy endures forever. And then if you keep reading, there's this big word, then. They declared it, and then the whole house was filled with glory. Notice they were proclaiming his goodness, and then what showed up? The glory. You have to understand, I have to understand, that one of the greatest signs that people are not looking for. They're all looking for bad. And, and I want to say this as I'm really trying to get done like right now because I have to. Is this. Why is it that we make the end times all about the supernatural in regards to evil? I listen to people today. Oh, we're in the last days. The beast. The antichrist. The false prophet. Well, why do we always magnify the evil supernatural? And we don't understand. What about Acts chapter 2 in verse 16? We've been in the last days for 2,000 years when Peter stood up and said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel, that in the last days saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall have dreams, your old man's visions and dreams. And upon my servants and my handmaidens in those days, saith the Lord, I will pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens, signs on the earth below. What about that? You know why I believe that more than I do the beast, the police, and Gog, Magog, and Eggnog? I'm not against it. It's because when you promote the goodness of God, he cannot help himself. He will bring his glory because the goodness of God and the glory of God are connected. All right, last thing on this verse. I'm closing my Bible. The good news shall be preached. The good news shall be promoted. And then... God will answer as a witness. His glory will come. And then watch what the next part of that verse says. Then the end will come. I want you to stand to your feet. Because you know what I challenge you today? Rather than get caught up in the high gas prices, inflation, what's going to happen with, you know, gold and, 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 and technocurrency or whatever it's called. And I think there's wisdom to it. I'm not saying that. But we get so caught up looking at all the bad that can go wrong. We are not looking for God's goodness. The Bible says what overcomes evil? The good, really? The goodness. If America's supposed to repent and we're judged, um, then why does it say the goodness of God leads people to what? Now, I'm not talking about the mushy, user-friendly gospel. I'm not talking about that has no power. I'm talking about preaching and declaring the goodness of God. Acts 10, 38, Jesus went about doing good, and he demonstrated casting out devils. We don't even do that anymore, except you do it here. I can feel it. We've got to promote the good. I want you to say this with me. If I had more time, I'd minister to you, but I'm going to go to the next service. But let's just lift our hand up to God and say, Lord God... You are good. Your mercy endures forever. I receive your goodness. I receive your mercy. It is well with me. 
and all that concerns me. Even with this country, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, thank you that you said that that is when the end of all things shall be. When we proclaim your goodness and you demonstrate it in Jesus' name. Let's give it up for Pastor as he comes. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Looking forward to preaching more. <laughs> Hallelujah. You may be seated. Wasn't that good? You know, I tell you what, that was a great word. I wish I could talk like he talks. Doesn't that sound like a he sounds like a radio announcer? I mean, it just it just how many ever remember C.M. Ward? Anybody ever remember that guy? Uh, well, I'm trying to talk good. <laughs> he can really talk great. Praise God. Well, uh, I want to receive a special love offering for Brother Kuhneman today. I'm going to ask the ushers to come. If you need an envelope, hold up your hand, and the ushers will give you an envelope. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Did you enjoy that? What would you like the best about that word? All of that. Praise God. That was a good word. That was a great word. God's getting ready to do something big, isn't he? Hallelujah to the Lord. Was anyone downtown this week when the shooting took place? Anybody downtown? Thank God God protected you. Uh, our city has been under a cloud since that happened. So, so evil, so, so wicked. We need to pray that God will protect our families and our homes. Uh, last night in uh, Alabama, over 20 kids were shot. We don't know, we know at least six were killed. Kids, last night in Chickasaw Park, four were shot. Two of our teenagers died. Kids, and we need uh, we need protection. Usually, after something that took place, within 13 days there is another copycat shooting. But I don't believe it has to happen to us in the name of Jesus. Would you reach over and join the hand of someone next to you? I want you to pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you for your protection. A gun will not shoot me. A knife will not cut me. Fire will not burn me. There's a wall of protection about my family, about my children, about my bloodline, and we will not die before our time. In Jesus' name. A number of years ago, someone went into Kroger down here in Hurstburn, started shooting, killed a number of people. One of our ladies, she's on the platform. She had pulled up to Kroger. She was sitting in her car ready to get out about the same time that man walked in. And the Lord spoke to her and said, stay right here a minute. So she just said, you know, she just sat there. And what she did, that guy went in there and started shooting, shooting, shooting. But God protected her. God protected her. God protected her. And God will protect you. And he'll protect your family. Hallelujah. Ushers, I want you to come. Pray with me. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for the word of the Lord. Let this offering be more than enough to meet every need. Let it be seed that's planted for my family as well. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you as you give. Hallelujah. Tonight, what time is the service? Monday and Tuesday? Six o'clock. Six o'clock. A lot of people will be coming in. If they think it's at seven, you'll be able to get a good seat. Hallelujah. I praise the Lord. Amen. Praise God.
Let's all stand, everybody standing. We're going to go out of here with a shout. We're going to shout the name of Jesus three